So welcome to Scanner School. My name is Phil Lichtenberger. My amateur radio call sign is W2LAE, and this podcast is here to teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. This is session number 99 of the podcast, and all the session notes can be found online at scannerschool.com slash session 99. Before we jump into this week's episode, I have a quick favor to ask of you. My goal is to have 100 five-star reviews in iTunes by the end of the year. It's the end of 2019. So I'm asking you for your help here. If you could do me a big favor and leave me an honest review, I'm not asking for a five-star review. I'm just asking you for an honest review in iTunes. You can do that by going to scannerschool.com slash iTunes. And in there, just leave me a review. And if you take a screenshot of that review and you leave me a DM in Instagram, again, my Instagram handle is at scannerschool, I'll put you in the running of a free tutoring session. Like I'm calling my consulting calls now, tutoring sessions to kind of keep within the school branding. So a winner will win that. So again, the contest will run or the goal is by the end of 2019. So please do this before the end of the year if you'd like to uh, get in the running of a free tutoring call. Again, I'm just looking for honest reviews here, five-star reviews. And if you don't think I'm worthy of a five-star review, let me know. And this will allow me to improve the podcast. I always love your feedback. And again, I'm here to uh, do this podcast for you guys. So if you think that there's something I could do to improve it, please let me know. I'm all ears. With that, let's go right into this week's podcast. Welcome to The Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. All right, guys, welcome back to Scanner School. On this session, we welcome back Harrison Wilson. Now, Harrison talked in session number 81 originally about using commercial radios for scanning. And obviously, last week, we talked about stolen radio IDs and how that tied into it. But Harrison is back because Harrison knows a lot about doing vehicle installs. Now, vehicle installs is something I have done as well, but not as a nine to five job, right? I've done this as putting my own personal gear into my own personal radio or putting into other people's cars. And it's always good to hear from somebody who does this on a professional level to get some extra points and tips. So we're going to jump right into this interview again, Harrison Wilson. Uh, Thank you, Harrison, for being back on the podcast. I greatly appreciate it. And Harrison definitely knows his stuff. So I want to say thank you so much again for coming back and hope you all get something out of this interview. So let's jump right into it. Harrison, welcome back. You are our uh, second repeat guest. I want to thank you for coming back on the podcast. Glad to be back and I'm glad I'm not the first one to come back. <laughs> no, it's fine. So today you're here to talk about mobile installations, which is really cool. And uh, something where I'm from in New York is a bit taboo when it comes to scanners. So I will relate to what it is I talked to you about in the two-way radio world as in amateur radio, which is what I'm allowed to do in my vehicle here in New York. But everything that I'm going to talk about, everything you talk about, go hand in hand when it comes to scanning. So let's go ahead and talk about mounting a radio in a vehicle. Yeah, sure. So uh, just so no one thinks that I'm just, you know, just another guy talking about this. Uh, this used to actually be how I made my living a couple of years back. And before that, I had customers in the D.C. region ranging from local all the way up to federal and did some pretty cool projects. So definitely something uh, I want to talk about just because uh, I feel like I meet a lot of people who, when they go to do installations, can't really come up with ideas and just need to understand where they get that creative spark from and just tips and tricks and things I use when uh, somebody's asking, hey, how do I stick that to the uh, dash, so to speak, uh, with the scanner or something like that? Right. So we're going to go a little bit beyond the the old cup holder mount. <laughs> you know, yeah, or the, uh, the suction cups or... Uh, duct even, tape, rubber yeah, bands, I've even seen professional cord. fire departments do duct tape, so... Yeah, whatever uh, works. Don't, don't, no, one, no one is immune <laughs> from the poor installation or the... Uh, The very Facebook shareable photo of a terrible installation. Yes, yes. I know there's a couple of groups out there that that like to share professional installs gone wrong. So let's start very, very basic here. What type of safety do we need to be worried about before we even start planning out where we're going to put the radios? I think that's a good place to start. 
So in any case, uh, I think my top safety tip is going to be airbag deployment. Uh, it's one of those things that we don't really think about just because we don't have airbags go off every day. So some people forget where they are. Um, if you need to know where they are, typically you'll look for the logos on the vehicle that will say SRS or airbag, uh, SRS standing for a supplemental restraint system. Other places you can look are in the owner's manual. And there's lots of tools out there that have been kind of developed for the fire community for uh, being able to uh, extricate victims from vehicles that are typically used to determine where airbag locations on the vehicle are, just because even with some of our older vehicles that only had it in the steering wheel and maybe even the passenger side above the glove box, we're now getting into all sorts of weird locations for airbags, which are explosive devices, and your seatbelt pretensions are explosive devices as well. So when we talk about that, you really want to know where they are because number one, you don't want to cut into those lines. Number two, you don't want to be mounting anything in the deployment or blast zone of those devices. And number Three, they are the worst place possible. You can try to ground stuff, especially in the example of like seatbelt pretensioners or seat mounts and things like that. So uh, want to make sure that we know where that those items are before we start screwing and gluing stuff onto our vehicles. Right. The last thing you want to do is have a nice install and never have it end up being a projectile when uh, when something happens. So I know I used, I used to drive around in my job with a vehicle just like that. We used to have, uh, I was the can you hear me now guy basically for the cell phone company. And I had, uh, let's see, about three, six, probably about eight or nine phones mounted to my dashboard. And you can only imagine in a, you know, a early 2000 era Jeep, uh, no, sorry, a GMC Jimmy. There's not a lot of dashboard space in there. So, mm. you know, getting creative pretty quick. <laughs> Pretty much put things in a blast zone, so I was quite fortunate that things didn't uh, go wrong for me on that one. But uh, yeah, there's definitely some some things to check out for, not only for your safety too, but you know for your passenger safety because chances are wherever you mount something is going to kind of be in their their area anyway if you mount it you know off to off to the side. So definitely look out for the airbags, and again, it would be in the either the pillars or you know the curtains, the steering wheel, the dashboard, those kinds of things. Well, so even like I'll throw out there that uh, knee uh, knee bolsters are now a new popular one. So okay, at the underside of a dash, you'll see a lot of uh, airbag systems now deploy around the knees uh, just to stop uh, the damage to your body going into the dash. A lot of classic installs used to put you know CBEs, scanners, things like that mm-hmm. underneath the steering wheel near the kick panel, things like that. And those are no longer good locations. So uh, lot, gotcha. lots to think about. There's lots of places uh, airbags can turn up nowadays. I remember, not to get us too far ahead of ourselves here, but I remember way back when, when uh, a certain type of motor company made a certain kind of police car and didn't tell anybody that things changed where the transmission was. And when they tried to do installs of uh, you know floor-mounted gear, one day they found out they was rolling through the transmission. So... Um, not good. Yeah. <laughs> so besides airbags, know where things are beneath the floor and outside the floor. And, you know, don't go drilling up either without knowing what you're drilling into either. So uh, I guess the, the story here or the, or, the, or the moral here is to know where things are basically in the car and look before you start drilling and screwing and, and whatnot. So that's a good advice where the, uh, the airbags and stuff are. What else do we need to be worried about or concerned with before we start mapping out or when we start mapping out the uh, the system? So electrical safety is kind of the next big safety point. We could still spark catch fire if we're not properly fusing, grounding, or running our cables, not providing proper edge protection if we have to go uh, through, through metal or across metal. I've seen so many installations where guys just want to take the easy way out. So they run a cable kind of like around or through a door jam or something like that. And for a temporary installation, most weather stripping can hold that. But even with weather stripping on like a door or something like that, uh, cables get bent uh, over time. So although I carry around magnet mount antennas for if I'm traveling and I'm in a rental vehicle or I'm in a situation where I just can't permanently mount an antenna. It's not really designed to be long term just because not only can you damage the cable, antennas are much less of a worry because it's not like a power cable where you're carrying large amounts of power. Uh, The electrical signal for antennas is much less of a concern. If you uh, accidentally ground it, you're just going to probably cause damage to the radio if it somehow gets grounded. Unlike a power cable that becomes grounded could start a fire if it's not properly fused. So um, if you're super nervous, obviously disconnect the ground from uh, the main battery when you go to start doing this sort of work. Uh, Pretty much every installation out there is going to tell you to do that. Um, I'm not going to say I did that every time. 
but that's just because I kind of knew the risk more than somebody who's just doing it for the first time. But if you're super nervous, the safest thing you can do is disconnect your uh, negative battery cable, and that'll help ensure that power is completely disconnected from the vehicle. Um, hybrid and all electric vehicles, that's going to be a little more difficult to do nowadays, uh, just because it's not an easy or trivial thing to disconnect the negative battery. So I can't say I've ever had to do an installation on some of these newer, fought, modern vehicles that are sleek and all electric and things like that and have all these advanced systems. But I'm sure there's plenty of resources out there on the internet on how to do that. And I'll give out some ideas of where I usually try to find ideas of how to get stuff installed and mounted on various vehicles. Okay. So that, that's good. Now, again, as far as safety with, with electrical, definitely if you, if you're not, if you're not comfortable with it, you know, at all, it may be, you know, just worthwhile to take it down to your local stereo shop. I mean, they could easily wire this in for you as well and just leave you with a little pigtail hanging so that you can plug your radio into it. But uh, all in all, I mean, it sounds scary up front right now, but for somebody who hasn't done it yet, but you know, this really isn't, it's not rocket science, right? It's basically two wires, right? You have a red, which is your, your pl- uh, positive 12 and your ground or your negative. So let's uh, talk about the difference between those and uh, where you would want to make the connection for each one. Sure. So one point I'll make real quick since you brought it yep. up is definitely consider visiting your local shops, uh, car stereo, or even some of the emergency vehicle outfitters. Um, they have, they're not going to turn away a dime, some of these shops. So uh, if you come up saying, hey, you know, I know I'm not working for the local fire department, local police department, but I want this installed. Some of them would be happy to help out. Uh, I used to work for one that, again, primarily did government organizations, but we had no problem if a person came up and said, hey, I got the scanner, I want it installed, or I, you know, I want a professional antenna mounting. So those shops totally will do it, and car audio shops will do it now too, just because the types of electronics we're installing into vehicles is getting more advanced. So it's no longer just, hey, you know, I want a new CD player in my vehicle. It's now gone to hey, I want a dashboard camera or uh, a radar detector or all these other devices. So most of these shops have enough knowledge that even though they don't know what a scanner is and have never seen it and say, hey, I need this device mounted when powered, they'll be able to help you out. But since you brought up power and where to get it, there's a lot of different places you can get it. If we're talking two-way radio, sometimes the best place is to go all the way to the battery. Um, But my preferred source a lot of times is a fuse panel. And usually what I do to tap power for a fuse panel is use a, a device called a uh, add a fuse or a tap a fuse. And that's kind of the least destructive way and easiest way to add power. Basically, you can pull out an owner's manual or sometimes it's printed on the back cover of the fuse panel, all the fuses uh, and what each of them is associated for. So, for example, you'll see a 10 amp red fuse tied to say headlights or horn and you might see a blue 20 amp fuse that says uh, air conditioning Um, but what you want to look for is a device that only powers on with ignition if that's what you want to do or for some reason you would like to leave it powered 24 7 365 find a device that is powered like that then you would take a device such as a test light to confirm that it does, in fact, turn on and off or a multimeter. If you're in this hobby and you're looking to do installation and I have plenty of other diagnostics work, multimeter is a great investment. And you can nowadays get a quality one for 20 to $40 on sites like Amazon and other local stores. Um, some of the local automotive shops will have pretty affordable multimeters that are fairly basic in scope in terms of features and functionality, but will get you enough to be able to run a test so you can you know use a red probe and a black probe so you put your black probe to ground and your red probe on the device you're checking and you check voltage and um, that'll tell you if your source is good and you can turn your key on and off make sure it's turning on and off things like that so the, the fuse panel is probably my favorite we get some people who like to be simpler and just use a cigarette lighter so there's nothing wrong with the cigarette lighter it's just the issues i typically have with them is they're not designed for a lot of power and they're fused appropriately. So don't go trying to put a bigger fuse to get more power out of it. The fuse was picked for a specific reason and size for a specific reason. These manufacturers get away with the least amount of wiring possible going between the fuse panel and that cigarette socket. So because of the prices of copper, they're not going to want to go any bigger than that. So if you've got more than just a quick scanner or something like that, or maybe a scanner and another device, you're probably going to want to try to find a more long-term solution. And a lot of this is going to be driven on, um, you know, hey, am I 
running my scanner in my vehicle for a long road trip, or is this something that I'm going to be u- using every day, constantly, you know, for the next several years? Right. Now let's take a, a look at the at the fuse panel though before we go any further. You talked about the airbags, right? Is is it pay to pull the fuse out of the airbags, or is that something you wouldn't want to do? I would almost say no. Uh, I rarely had a reason to want to just even touch anything with mm-hmm. the airbag. Inside of vehicles, everything that has to do with airbag wiring is usually covered in some sort of either yellow flex loom or some sort of protective sheathing that identifies it as airbag wiring. And oftentimes in vehicles, you'll see that the fuses and relays associated with the airbag system are also highlighted in yellow. You can find airbag fuses in there. And one of the best reasons I can give you not to go messing with those fuses is on certain brands of vehicles. If you attempt to pull the fuse for um, an SRS system, you'll send it into a reset mode. And depending on the manufacturer, you cannot get out of that test reset mode or limp mode or error mode without a trip to the dealer, which is not a cheap endeavor by any means. I've seen it cost anywhere from 80 bucks. So like a half an hour of labor all the way up to a couple hundred bucks just to get an airbag light reset because a fuse was pulled on the airbag system. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's definitely a, uh, a good thing to look out for that. So we talked about either running through a cigarette lighter, which you said is already fused or tapping into an existing circuit, right? So that would be when you tap into that, you'd have its own dedicated fuse attached to that as well. Is there a need then to run an inline fuse or would you just say it's good to go uh, based off the tap? So I'm always going to tell somebody to put in, if they think they need another fuse, add another one. Um, There's no such thing as over fusing. One of the old myths that came from the car audio installation world was that fuses degrade power, degrade performance, uh, especially with audio, but there's no such thing as overfusing. Definite, yeah, you are going to want to fuse it again is if you're in the situation where the line rating changes. So say, for example, you you want to run a 20 amp circuit and your tap fuse can support a 20 amp circuit coming off of the fuse, but you're going to split it off into two devices that only need a couple amps a piece. You would want to make sure that each of those branches off of your wiring is fused down because basically you want to make sure that the fuse is such that the rating is just above where you expect the maximum power to be because you want to make sure you create a safe enough situation. Otherwise, you're going to end up in a uh, uh, potential car fire or electrical fire or some other significant hazard if you're not properly fusing. And there's a massive gap between when the fuse blows and where the maximum power rating is. So usually that rating is 125% of the expected maximum amperage, which is can be fun to calculate and can be difficult to calculate, but there's plenty of guides out there online um, for sizing fuses. Right. And again, too, I mean, if, you, if you're that much of a doubt, you can look at the back of the wall wart that came with the scanner. Many of them are, you know, from anywhere from a half an amp, which is 500 milliamps uh, to, you know, three quarters of an amp, maybe even a full amp. So it'll tell you on that wall war too, you know, how much that can deliver. And that could be a good guide too, is as to how much your max would be on, on a fuse because the radio is not going to pull more than what that wall wart is rated for anyway. That's kind of what I've been doing on, on my install. When it comes to fusing also, we would want to fuse the positive, but do you recommend fusing the negative lead on that or no? So there are people out there that'll tell you you should fuse your ground. I've never personally seen a reason to. Uh, My Mm -hmm. trick with grounding is just to keep the ground as short as you need it. There's no reason to say, for example, if you're running power directly from the battery, trace a ground all the way back to the battery. I would try to find a good grounding spot. So what is a good grounding spot? Uh, Something that's going to be bare metal. Um, Usually the best trick is to find a manufacturer ground that's already in the location where you're mounting uh, with the amount of electronics that are in vehicles today, they're all over the vehicle. So usually if you start pulling back panels, pulling back carpet, you'll quickly find a spot. I would recommend never ever using a seat bolt or a seat belt bolt as a ground. There should be no reason you have to take those off. And I would avoid any trying to use any bolt for ground that requires uh, specific torque settings just because most people don't probably have the equipment to make sure that the bolt is torqued back to spec and you're kind of opening yourself to your own liability. So it's easier to try to find a vehicle ground that's already there. And if you don't have one, there's actually kits out there that are fairly reasonable in price that'll give you a drill bit that'll make a ground basically scrape away a little bit of the paint and it'll give you some sort of self-tapping screw or something like that 
to uh, be able to create your own effective ground. Okay, excellent. So we've talked about delivering power to the radio, either directly from the battery, from the cigarette lighter, or from the fuse panel. So that's pretty much, I would say, taps out those resources right there. Watch out definitely for the airbags. And then uh, I guess the next thing I do is uh, figure out, well, actually, I think the first thing would have been to do was to figure out where you want to mount the radio, right? So we're kind of getting a little bit out of order here. So let's talk about that. Where would you mount a radio? And then we'll talk about where you want to mount the antenna too. So um, I don't know which which order you want to take this in, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. So let's start with mounting the radio because that's kind of a, a more difficult one and more of a fun question to answer. So you're Picasso here and you're going to be the Picasso of uh, equipment installation. So you're trying to figure out what you have and where you need to install it. And you're looking for ideas. One of the best ideas I've or the best sources I've found for looking up where I should mount something, especially in some of these more difficult vehicles, is from the ham radio community. Not to say the scanning hobby is particularly small by any means, and usually most hams also have a scanner or two. But what you seem to find is that a lot of the ham users and even CB users out there have all seem to have your make and model vehicles. So what seems to happen from a lot of guys is they get all discouraged because they're not driving around in a vehicle that's typically used by public safety, like some of those police sedans or police SUVs. So they can't just go out and buy a console that has all this great universal mounting space that they can use to mount their equipment. And so they get all discouraged. Yeah. Right. Or you find out you don't have a column shifter, you have a floor shifter, then you realize, oh, great. I just, I made a mistake. <laughs> so. Right. So my current vehicle has a very large console in it now. And it's just kind of disappointing at first, just because it's more difficult and it requires more time and more thought of where I'm going to mount equipment. There is some consideration there. It may even get to the point where if you had, say, a BCD 536 or like a TRX 2 and you needed a place to mount those sorts of devices, you would maybe want to consider if a portable uh, scanner modified for mobile use would be more beneficial. So something like a cell phone type mount and then running your wires up to that cell phone mount so you can use it in the vehicle would give you more flexibility in mounting. One of the nice things about the Whistlers that they still offer is the remote head. Uh, that's kind of a disappointment with uh, unit in is the BC RH ninety six uh, right stop being compatible around the time the BC uh, was the BCD nine nine six P two came out. So although you can use it, there is a there is a, a guide out there if you search around on Radio Reference where folks have come up with a way to translate an RH ninety six to work with the P two, but for the most part, it's kind of a a disappointing game from unit and right there for remote mounting yeah i mean i had an rh96 that i never actually installed so it was new in the box and i sold it for about the point about the same price i paid for it so it was that was a good investment <laughs> so it uh, it retained value for a while but uh, you're right though with all the new radios out there it's i mean they're getting especially the fcs 200 i mean that's like uh it's a din plus you know it's it's a bigger radio so hiding something like that is going to take a lot more effort and then uh the trx2 though it's a really nice detachable faceplate, which, so if you're from the amateur radio community and, and a lot of the mobile radios from amateur radio, they come with detachable faceplates. You know, they, they understand there was a problem with mounting radios. Uh, back in the day when you had the old boxy cars with, with yards and yards of uh, dash space, it wasn't that big of a deal. But now everything's all all curved and everything else. So it does make it a little bit harder to uh, to mount a bigger radio with a radio mount. So what are some of the tricks that you have though when it comes to finding a location? I mean, we, we obviously talked about you can't block a airbag or you know a curtain or something like that so where would you look to mount a radio if you were mounting either a regular mobile radio or a uh, a handheld that you're going to use in a mobile environment so the first thing i typically do is i kind of like i said earlier i look at the ham radio community and typically what i'll do is google uh, my car make and model and ham radio install because you'll find that the ham radio community has done these sort of installations and uh, with the way some of the equipment can come from ham, especially if you start talking HF and you've got screwdriver antennas and antenna tuners and all that stuff, they've kind of helped give you some ideas, give you that spark, give you that inspiration of, hey, maybe I could mount it sideways here or, you know, maybe I've got some overhead space I can mount. Some of the typical places you kind of have to think about if you're willing to go this far is what kind of panels you have. So we're seeing on some of the new cars, they have a lot of plastic panels that can come apart and come apart in multiple pieces and not come apart like break, but come apart like when you go to disassemble the console. So what I've been finding is you could remove a panel 
And then you find you go and if you want to be able to return it to stock, you can go even to the dealer or the manufacturer websites on the internet, places like that, and find a replacement panel for 20, 30 bucks, which can kind of seem like a lot depending on how long term it is. But if you really want a good installation, you could remove that panel and be able to cut through plastic using tools like a Dremel or some other spiral cut tool. But part of it is just kind of being comfortable with exploring the vehicle if you don't have kind of that great spot to just mount something on top. Um, Some other ideas I've seen a lot of recently involve laptop type mounts. So it seems like although for public safety, the consoles are kind of limited to those typical vehicles you see running around as police cars or fire chief vehicles, things like that, you are finding that With a lot of local governments, they're using a wider array of vehicles for things like public works or utilities departments or animal control or whatever, and they still need laptop mounts. So some of these laptop mount communities and manufacturers are catering to that need. So you could probably find a laptop pole base mount and use that pole mount to be able to give you a mounting location. So again, a lot of this is kind of driven by price, and that's where it kind of becomes difficult because it... It could be a very easy proposition to take a $500 scanner and turn it into a $2,000 installation. Yeah. And for some people driving around that are younger, that could be the worth the price of the car. So, yeah. Uh, well, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we've gotten to the point now, too, where people have, I've seen people consider changing their cars just so they have more room to mount stuff. One of the best things to look for if you're looking for a car or something to consider is a double DIN radio. Now, if you don't know what a double DIN or a single DIN, you kind of mentioned the SDS. 200 and how it's din and a half the din size is a defined standard size so with the double din you could very affordably change your car stereo out to a single din to some other model and mount a scanner below it and gain either a pocket or uh, which you would mount underneath the stereo or even um, what i used to do with my last vehicles i had a double din stereo that i switched to a single din on top and then mounted the uh, unit in uh, BCD 536 HP underneath that on the same mount quite easily with minimal modification. I just had to drill two extra holes on the bracket for the radio to be able to mount the scanner. But I was able to fit both of them in a double din location and have basically a factory looking scanner installed in my vehicle. Right. And that was exactly what I was going to bring up too, is the, the DIN size. So if you can't picture what a DIN is in your head, most of the mobile scanners that are out there now that are available, right? Anything from basically Unidin, the 15, the 996, those are DIN size scanners. And um, you stack two of them on top of each other, basically that's a double DIN. So most... I guess most radios out there now are double din or even they're getting even larger now with these larger displays on them. So, um, you know, but the, you got to watch out too. A lot of these radios now are inter, they interface with more stuff in the radio, in the car, whereas you have the controls and the, the stereo. So there's, you know, you, you're going to have to figure out what's it worth more to you to have the scanner someplace or to have the full functionality of your, of your radio. There's even third party uh, adapters you can put out there that will tie into the vehicle controllers with the aftermarket stereo. So you don't really need to lose all the functionality on it, but there is, you're going to have some give and take on this one. So you talked about really quickly, you know, a great place to put a scanner where it's going to be permanently mounted, always visible, and a great spot for you to see it, use it, touch it. And it's not going to be in the way of anything else be on the dashboard. But let's dial it back. Let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, an easy way to mount or even just to put a handheld scanner, right? We all have cup holders. So let's uh, let's start there with that. You know, dropping a radio into a cup holder, is that a good starting point to mount a or temporarily mount a scanner? I mean... I guess from a safety perspective, I should discourage Mm. it just because that could become a projectile. But I will freely admit that I'm one of those people that does it on a regular basis, whether it be a two ray radio or a scanner. It sometimes go or a pager even. It just goes in the cup holder just because that's easy. That's that's there. Um, That's a solution. And and it kind of projects the sound upwards. So I was just going to say that. Yep. Yep. They do a really good job of projecting the sound. And then beyond that, though, I mean, they do have mounts that are made specifically to go into a cup holder that then would you would mount, I guess, a cell phone to. But they have them out there, I believe, now, too, that will allow you to mount a, uh, a portable radio to it, correct? Yep. So this is kind of a interesting rabbit hole in itself that we can go down, which is uh, the portable mounting options. So a lot of that draws from the cell phone community and some of the cell phone mounting options. So 
the first thing I like to say, and I know you mentioned cup holder, but I can kind of bring this into any sort of handheld, portable, or even cell phone type mounting, is you have to f- pick your base. So you start with a base. So if you don't want kind of anything that looks more permanent you and you want something that can go from car to car, you could definitely start with a cup holder. There's cup holder mounts for cell phones. You just have to make sure that the maximum opening is going to be wide enough to support whatever handheld type device you're using. Um, so, you know, get your ruler out, measure your scanner that you're using, and then make sure you buy one that says maximum width of the phone, quote unquote, that you would be using with this mount is wide enough to support your cell phone. But if you want to take it a step further, companies like Ram Mount, who is one of my favorites, has a cup holder base that you put in conjunction with an arm, and then they have some device specific mounts. So the example that immediately comes to my head is if you're a fan of the unit in Home Patrol or Home Patrol 2. The unit in mount that you can purchase for those scanners is actually a ball mount that would fit a RAM ball mounting system. And when you start to check out RAM's website, you can start to see a lot of the options that they have. So, for example, with RAM, uh, my last vehicle had a grab handle that was placed on the A pillar, which is the pillar between the driver's window and the windshield. And I was able to safely remove a bolt that held that grab handle on it and replace it with a mount developed by Ram for use with a motorcycle. And so the bolt that was there actually fit into this little ball mount that had a hole in it to put a bolt through. And then I was able to clamp a Ram mount quite safely um, to that mount. So if you want to go something other than a cup holder route, uh, there's other companies I can uh, start to list off that you should check out their website. So the first one that comes to my head is ProClip USA, ProClipUSA.com. They have a ton of base mounts. They are plastic molded mounts, and most of them are what are called no drill. And so they're designed to make the installation so simple and so easy, but yet safe. So typically they'll have like a small strip of adhesive just to give it a little extra strength. But for example, in my vehicle, they kind of clipped into where the air vent is. And those are what I use on a day-to-day basis with my cell phones. And they offer a button type mount. So if you have a handheld scanner that uses a button to go onto a belt clip, you could remove the belt clip and drop the button into the button type mount. And that's a quick way to be able to put your handheld scanner where it's easily viewable. You could leave some wires hanging there. So if you use like a BNC adapter to SMA adapter for a lot of those scanners, then you have a quick release, you have power. And some other base mount manufacturers are Panavice. So Panavice makes a lot of vehicle specific. They also have a couple universal mounts, but their vehicle specific ones can get quite interesting. So both ProClip and Panavice let you look search by make and model. Two other companies I've used in the past are CUDA, which is K as in Kilo, U as in Uniform, D as in Delta, A as in Alpha, USA.com. And they make these cell phone style mounts that kind of look like the old uh, 90s car phone looking mounts. But they basically are fiberglass molded leather wrapped mounts that you can uh, use to drill uh, mounts onto directly. And then ProFit International is the last company I'm thinking of. So their website is Pro, uh, P-R-O-Fit, F-I-T, dash international, which is abbreviated to intl.com. And all of these companies make vehicle specific mounts and you'll be kind of shocked by the amount of catalog they have in terms of vehicles and one thing i like to talk about with ProClip is they actually are the wing of a swedish company i believe which is brodit b-r-o-d-i-t so you can actually go to brodit's website and look at some of the european models and actually have a wider catalog and then take that same part number and put it into ProClip's website and purchase that mount which isn't easily or normally found on their website, but it'll pop up if you use the Brodit part number onto ProClip's website, so you can get even wider selection of bit mounting bases. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Scanner School is sponsored by East Coast Pagers.com. Now, East Coast Pagers is one of my online companies, and I want to tell you about the end of year promotions running right now on East Coast Pagers on Unication products. Now, if you buy 10 G1 Pagers, you will get one free. So that's 11 for the price of 10. Now, you can mix and match colors and band splits. So if you're in the process of phasing things out, you will go from low band to UHF. You want one low band and a couple UHF channels or a couple of UHF Pagers. Boom. This is a great way to get it. Now, the G4s and G5 
pagers are $100 off of MSRP. So that drops the G4 down to $545 and it drops the G5 down to $645. Now, these prices here, they include shipping. Okay, I don't charge anything extra for shipping. Now, the final promotion, if you buy 10 pagers, you get the five-year extended warranty included. Pagers normally ship with a two-year warranty. This is a great, easy, and free way to get the five-year warranty. Now, I have to put my order in of 10 pagers. So if a um, little secret between me and you, if a couple of us pull pagers together and I put them all in as one order, we can all get the five-year warranty. Don't tell anybody. These promos expire December 15th, 2019. So contact me right now, phil at eastcoastpagers.com or go to eastcoastpagers.com, browse through our catalog and we'll click on the contact button to reach out directly to me. Again, that's phil at eastcoastpagers.com. Again, eastcoastpagers.com. And now for the conclusion of this week's podcast. In fact, yeah, I had Kenneth on, uh, Kenneth Fowler on a couple weeks ago when we talked about DMR. And uh, we had talked about that as well, as it was mounting it using the European side. This way, it gave you another you know option to mount something to. So what's interesting is with, I talked about earlier with, with the Jimmy I had for work, where I had all the cell phones on it. What I had was a ProFit mount and a Panavise mount and a couple of brackets. And I was able to take the two of them together because the screw holes are kind of universal. And I was able to make a, a deck out of it. And I mounted it, which is really cool. You took the, the fascia board off of like the dashboard, the bezel, uh, which gave you access to the radio screws. You took out one screw from the radio and then this the kit went right onto that one screw and you just screwed it back on again and put the bezel back on. That was your nice little um, mount for what would be the, either the two-way radio or in my case, the cell phones. So, um, it's 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 amazing what you can do with these with these things. You, I mean, once you start putting them together, it's like a, a construction set. You know, it's like being a kit. And you can put this plate here with that arm there and this bracket there. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah. I, I, so the one thing I wanted to bring up, or the two things I wanted to bring up uh, that you just made me think about was all these manufacturers' websites usually do a good job of letting you see the manual. So if you're kind of curious about how much disassembly and how involved it's going to be, they're going to do a very good job of being able to. Uh, give you a copy of that manual, just get a quick PDF copy, then you can, and the directions will tell you how much disassembly is going to be required. Sometimes it's just kind of just putting a plastic jam tool in just to create the clearance to install the mount. Sometimes it's more involved, like you said, with the removing the fascia, unscrewing a single bolt, putting a bolt back in. But since you mentioned it as well, and with the construction set, so the mounting holes lining up, what you're typically seeing there is a mount called AMPS, Alpha, Mike, Papa, Sierra. So an AMPS mount is a universal mount. So for anybody who's had to mount a flat screen TV on the wall, they've probably heard the term VESA, Victor, Echo, Echo, Sierra, Alpha. AMPS is kind of the same idea where the manufacturers came together and created a specification on a square mount for a lot of these mobile devices. So what you can start to look for is if you're on RAM site, you can get an adapter that goes from a RAM mount or a RAM base to an AMPS mount and then use the AMPS mounting plate from, say, ProClip or pro fit and use those parts to make together mounts so you like the the base from one manufacturer but you like the device holder from another manufacturer well you can now combine them um, one of the reasons i like pro fit is the ball size is the size of a garmin type ball mount if anybody who's ever had a garmin plug and play um, gps knows that little ball that they use as a mount and both RAM and the ProFit themselves make devices that go onto that mount. So now you can start to get creative. Maybe you have an old windshield mount for a Garmin line around and you want to put a base onto it. Hey, you could take that base and go get a uh, ball mount for that. I believe ProFit calls it the G3 mounting system, but really it's the same ball size as a Garmin. And you can look up the specs on the Garmin ball size and compare that to some of the, the specs of the RAM ball size. So the RAM ball mounts use various sizes and one of the sizes they support is that garmin mount size so it's not just you have to be stuck on one manufacturer definitely look around and some of these manufacturers uh share standards to make sure that their devices and mounts and holders are compatible with each other you probably have a good point too when you said gps so let's talk about that for a second uh the typical place to mount a gps if anybody is still using them would be on the windshield 
So obviously we're going to be able to find some mounts that suction cup to a window, but uh, check local laws. I think right, California is one of these places where you can't have anything mounted to uh, to the dashboard. I know here in New York, if anything dangling from your rearview mirror, they're going to get you on that too. So New York's a fun place to live. So one thing to remember is to make sure you you check your your uh, state or your country's uh, vehicle law to find out where and where you can't put these things. So that's a, our little disclaimer on that one. So now we have... We got a good list here. So we got where you're going to plug this into, how you're going to wire it up, where you're going to mount the radio. Do you have anything else to bring up for mounting the radio before we go on to antenna placement? Uh, not that I can think of right now. I'm sure I'll definitely okay. think of some, may, possibly in a minute. Just well, with I, have, I got yeah, one, yeah. but I, I'm going to wait till the end. I was going to talk about looms. So, but I figured you have to talk about antenna and coax. Uh, how oh, yeah. Tidy, absolutely. How we tidy everything up at the end. So, oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, zip ties. <laughs> <laughs> Velcro everywhere. So, um, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so let's talk about antennas. Um, obviously, we're gonna just ignore the fact that we don't know what antenna to buy because that's just a whole other avenue we're not gonna go down right now. Uh, we're gonna assume you have an antenna. Um, we're gonna assume that you have a base that you know which, which you're gonna mount to either NMO, mag mount, or something like that, right? I mean, obviously, if it's NMO, let's talk NMO real quick. You know, I'll let you take NMO and the mounting differences for NMO, and then we'll uh, we'll then go into coax. Sure, so. absolutely. So the first thing I think of when I think of NMO is most people are kind of scared to do drill through installs. So I totally get it if you have a vehicle where you're say leasing it and you might get dinged if you drill a hole through the roof. Yeah, um, might get dinged. It, <laughs> yeah. Well, so some of us uh, have lease programs that actually allow radio installation as part of the lease. It's kind of a, a less common thing out there, but uh, there are lease plans and lease programs out there that allow you to do that sort of modification as long as it's within reason and within limits, but that's less common. So don't go try searching for that. But I mean, myself included are lucky enough to have a vehicle through a lease program that allows for that to happen. I just haven't taken advantage of it yet. But I think a lot of people get nervous about drilling through the roof uh, for water leaking or things like that. Or do they're just concerned about resale? So my biggest thing is if you place the antennas well and you think about where you're mounting them, uh, there's ways to really prevent a lot of damage to the installation. And what's nice about the NMO, or as some people refer to it, the Motorola mount, the NMO mount you can get in a typical size, which is a three-quarter inch drill. So you have to put a three-quarter inch hole in your roof. But there's also thin mounts now where it's only a three-eighths, so about half the size of a three-quarter mount to be able to put a hole through your roof. And then if you have to go remove the antennas for sale or something like that, you'll just pull the antenna out put in a, a plug maybe with a little bit of silicone and it won't even be noticeable just because you get on the roof of some of these vehicles now and with everything that they have for putting in say a roof rack or roof rails or mounting systems and things like that if you choose your placement well it almost becomes unnoticeable when it's removed as long as you plug it up properly one of the things too is you is i know they make such special bits for NMO installations do you recommend using the special bit or can you just go ahead and start going to town with your uh your no more hole saw, hole um, saw. I, w I would definitely tell most listeners and most people came up to me to do your own research um sometimes those special bits that you see are nothing more than the same hole saw you could get at your local uh, hardware store step bits seem to be my favorite um you can do quick online searches on why step bits are a little bit different and a little bit better for drilling through sheet metal, which is typically what these roofs are made out of. And definitely consider whether your vehicle is made out of aluminum or steel. The two of those cut a little bit differently. For the most part, you don't have too much to worry about between the two, but um, definitely something to consider. Um, if you go drilling antenna mounts, um, don't drill into plastic, don't drill into fiberglass. The only reasons I say to avoid those is they, are, they don't have a good ground plane. So all the benefits of drilling through a roof to mount an antenna are kind of lost on the fact that there's no ground plane. Now there are ways to add a ground plane, but really the best thing to do is mount to some sort of metal surface that's integrated into the vehicle's overall electrical ground. Right. So let's talk about the actual placement that you just talked about. If you find a good place for it, what's an easy way to find a placement for the antenna? Cause obviously you don't want to drill down and find out you're drilling into a, a, you know, a support bracket right beneath it. You're not gonna be able to put the actual NMO mount. What, what's your recommendation is you drop the entire headliner or you drop a dome light or how do you typically do with the installation when it comes to uh, NMO? 
So it's going to depend on the manufacturer. And sometimes, unfortunately, the best answer is to not necessarily like drop and pull the entire headliner out of the vehicle, but to remove enough of the trim that you can drop the headliner just enough to see underneath of it. You want to make sure you're not drilling through anything structural or wiring. Rarely are you going to run into the issue that you're running into wiring, but you don't just want to go drilling blind into your roof. Uh, Mostly you want to know what's underneath because there may be additional structural members. There may actually be some electrical wiring. Um, Newer vehicles are coming with technologies such as active noise canceling, or they have voice control, or they have overhead entertainment systems, things like that. So there is a potential for wiring to be in there based on the age of the vehicle. Typically, a dome light is actually usually a good place to start. You should bring that up now. I wouldn't want to drill directly underneath the dome light just because there might not be enough clearance. You you can definitely try to see if you can find out a measurement to figure out if there would be enough clearance to make sure that when you screw that NMO mount down, that the bottom of it doesn't come in contact with the dome light, just because typically these dome lights are ground themselves and you don't want to ground your antenna out. So if you have a way you can measure, basically know the height between the bottom of the headliner and the bottom of the roof, and then t- subtract away how tall the dome light is, you might find you have enough room. But if nothing else, it's a good spot just to go, go looking for some of these locations. And it totally goes back to doing internet searches. There's plenty of people out there who've probably already drilled through that roof for one reason or another, and it might not even be for antenna placement. It might be, you could probably find on various car specific forums people who've done projects like sound deadening or sunroof installation so they might have already posted a picture of what the roof looks like underneath of it so you can use those pictures to kind of be your clue so to speak of where you should start where you should begin to plan where you should start looking for a place to mount a antenna right i'm glad you said you know sunroof because that was the other thing i was, was going to bring up too a lot of these cars they have the retractable sunroofs so you don't want to all of a sudden find out you're, you're you know opening your sunroof up and you hit the antenna mount. So that's a good idea to see what that's going to be as well. So as far as placing the antenna, right, on top of the roof is usually the best place for it. Somewhere in the middle, you know, I've seen them on trunk lids and whatnot. Uh, Personally, I've mounted mine on the back of my glass. I have a pickup truck, so I would mount it on the back glass with 3M tape and a special mount from Diamond. But I use antennas that don't require ground, uh, you know, a, a, a ground plane. But you have to know what type of antenna you're using. Then you figure out what type of mount, right? It goes with that and the, the mount placement. So now we're looking at mounting or running the coax. If we're going to mag mount, right? Like we talked about earlier, you get to bring it through a door jam or a trunk lip or, you know, with my old car, my, my very first car was an old celebrity. And uh, I had a mag mount on that one and it was easy. It just went through the back of the trunk and uh, tucked it behind the front seat or the back seat rather and underneath the, uh, the, the carpet and out the center console. And, and that's that's where it went to the uh, two-way radio. But um you know, it's things that part of the install really hasn't changed, right? It's just finding a channel, tucking the coax in there and just making sure it's out of sight, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So back to kind of what I said way early on is you have to consider your pinch points. So if you're running coax across anything like say you decide to remove the weather stripping and run it through that, even if you're doing a mag mount, you have to consider if you're going to be putting pressure on it and it's going to be slicing against the pressed metal where they usually mount the weather stripping to. You might want to pick a spot where two pieces of weather stripping come in contact with each other because usually that's going to be two soft mounts. But the other consideration there, speaking from personal experience and learning the hard way, is oftentimes when you use uh, the weather stripping location as a place to run your cable, uh, you can find that water will leak in using that location. So that's why a lot of people kind of gravitate towards doing, like you said, kind of like a glass mount or something like that. Something I definitely want to steer people away from is, especially in this hobby, is try to avoid a lot of the covert mounts and covert mounting. My first scanner mount and or my first antenna I did for a scanner installation, I did a basically it looked like a long random wire antenna that used two suction cups to go across the windshield. And what I was finding with my reception was that my reception was based upon which direction my vehicle was pointing. So basically, wherever I had the windshield pointed was kind of where my strongest reception was. So you have to consider that too is, you know, you're really trading off performance if you can't get that antenna high and well grounded, but you know, there's always trade-offs with that. So do I want it high and visible and well grounded, or do I need to be able to park a very tall vehicle inside of a garage? Um, There are antennas that use flexible materials so that if you did want to mount it high, it would 
it would basically be able to take strikes against it, whether you're entering a parking garage or even your own garage. There's a lot to consider. I just try to drive people away from the covert mounts because it seems like there's a weird trend. And I have to admit, I kind of fell into it when I first started doing it was, you know, I, I want all these scanners in my vehicle, but I don't want anything on the outside that screams. I've got radio equipment in this vehicle. So you look at like the covert type antennas. And so those are a lot of trade off for performance for the ability to be more discreet. So uh, a glass mount with a, a no ground plane required antenna, like you mentioned, is probably a good trade off for that sort of solution. Right. Well, actually, the, the mount I was using was actually for a uh, UHF style mount. So it wasn't even through the glass. I don't even like those through the glass ones. You hear a lot of horror stories about those, especially with like the uh, tinted glass. They, they attenuate down too much. So yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I always try and push people away from that. But this, the mount I was using is, uh, it's, I think it's an HRKS by Diamond. So it has a, um, you can you can come in an, an NMO or or UHF or you know PL two five nine, which is what I have, and it comes with really thin coax. I think it was like one seventy four, if I'm not mistaken. But I did exactly what you said. Was I took off the third brake light. And I wired the coax in from the underside, the third brake light, so it was on the downside of it. But water still finds a way to wick in. And, uh, you know, after a couple of good rainstorms, like we have tonight, a nor'easter, I know in the morning my car's going to smell damp because the water is going to wick its way in through the coax. So, you know, it just seems like, you know, the, the driest method really to do is, is NMO through the, through the, through the roof and, and it'd be watertight. But other options, though, I mean, you could probably come in through, um, I guess there's like the, uh, uh, when you close the doors, right, for the car, you get that little uh, vent that happens so that you, you, the air's got someplace to go. Or uh, underneath the car, too, you got gaskets, so you could poke in through there, and then silicone goes up really well if it's on the other side. But really, the coax, you don't want to have a mile worth of coax going from the antenna to the radio. A lot of these antenna mounts only come with about 12 to you know twelve feet or so of coax, so you'll end up adding more coax to the install if you go that way with, you know, again... Um, you got to do what's best though for you and, and your mounting. So we have the antenna picked out, right? And again, going with antennas too, what you were saying, uh, the flexible antennas. I have my antenna, uh, the one I mounted on the glass, has a fold over base. So I can lift the antenna up a little bit and then it hinges down. I've also seen diamond make antenna mounts where it clips to the roof rail or the roof rack and then it will hinge down by, you know, either via a motor or you can just unscrew a little wing nut and the whole antenna will hinge down too. So it's just got to remember though, before you pull into the garage that, you know, you take the antenna down. I forgot to take the antenna down when I went to the mechanic and I got it back one day. I'm like, the antenna doesn't look right. It, I always thought it had another section on top. And then I went through my pickup truck bed and found the top of this top of the antenna in the back of the bed. So at least the glass didn't crack. I, I mean, I know that that mount was definitely strong enough. So uh, the antenna failed before the, the mount failed or the glass failed. So that was good. But I mean, to fill in the gap here, it was on the vehicle lift. And I guess the antenna touched the the roof of the, the garage. So, but. Yep. Um, so something know, else you just made me think of back to kind of the where you get inspiration from. So one of the things you can do for antenna mounting, particularly if you have a four by four vehicle or SUV, is a lot of these off-road communities um, love their CB, love their GMRS. Oh, yeah, they, they certainly do. Yep. So make sure you check out a lot of those guys to see if they have an antenna mount and how they've run their wiring because you can get a lot from that. And the other option too, and this is kind of an odd one, is think about auxiliary lighting mounting. So I had a vehicle that a manufacturer, third-party manufacturer made a mount for doing um, what are called ditch lights. Um, a lot of people kind of think of them as those lights that sit at the bottom of the windshield. But you're seeing a lot more people offer them for a lot more vehicles. And one of the options you could use that for was instead of screwing a light mount through it, which usually just uses a single bolt mount, is it became a perfect antenna mount and it was grounded all the way through the vehicle. So that becomes like a hood channel mount. And I think my antenna coax ended up being pretty short when I did that as well because it went in through the hood channel, ran down and through the firewall, uh, made sure to use a grommet that I sealed up with some silicone to stop weather and to stop chafing. And it went right to the back of the scanner and it was probably only like two or three feet. So that's actually another, a really good idea. That's a great yeah. idea. Yep. So definitely one of the other ideas I have too is when you're doing a lot of this stuff, uh, it's definitely worth it if you haven't it to learn to crimp your own coax or even solder your own coax. You can purchase a lot of the places where you purchase your NMO antenna offer the NMO mounts. And one of the ways you can purchase the NMO mount is pretty much in pieces, ready to go on RG58, which seems to be the most common uh, type of coax used for these installations. 
And so when you learn how to get or you learn how to mount RG58, how to crimp it, that goes a long way in this hobby. So you learn how to put a BNC or an SMA or the various connectors you might want to use, maybe mini UHF. And then you learn how to put an NMO mount on the other end. Now you've created a custom length cable and you can also take this with you into other aspects of the hobby. So it's definitely something worth learning. And, and sometimes it can actually help you save money just because the cost of buying bulk cable assembled in pieces or in pieces and then assembling yourself. And then there's times where it actually is cheaper to buy the manufactured cable. We were finding when I was doing this professionally that it was cheaper for us to buy several bulk packs of the 50 foot NMO, even though most of our installations were 15 feet or under, and then just have all the excess cable when we needed to make little jumpers and stuff like that. So definitely learn um, soldering and crimping your own coax and the tools out there to do it are remarkably affordable. And there's tons of videos on so- places like YouTube on how to do this. Yep. And learn. it's really not that difficult. It's, it's fairly easy. And I think I have a whole pile of two of those, uh, the, the crimp for the BNC, cause it was the same ones I was using for, uh, the CCTV it ends up being exactly the same. Cause it's, you know, they use 58 as well. So pretty much goes right on there. So we got the antenna mounted. We got the coax router. We could have, we have power. What about speaker placement? Do we want to use speaker that's on the scanner itself, or do we want to use a speaker that is hidden somewhere underneath the seat, or what do you recommend as far as that goes? Well, we could totally get into a whole other topic on that. Well, but... <laughs> let's, let's not say we did. <laughs> so um, for speaker placement, one of the things you definitely want to consider is if you need one. So there's a lot of times where you might not need it. Um, I've had plenty of installations where the – how it's mounted is loud and clear enough, especially if you're doing kind of the cell phone mount we talked about earlier and using a handout scanner. You're probably going to have that speaker forward firing. You're probably going to be okay. Most mobile installations, I've found you more or less have to consider a external speaker of some type. The home controls are pretty nice because it's a front mount speaker. It's forward facing. It's quite loud and clear. But when the speakers are down firing and you've kind of mounted it into a dash, it's not going to be as good. So you need to consider a speaker. And what's nice about the speaker is pretty much all the manufacturers have decided eighth inch audio jacks are the way we want to go. And pretty much a lot of options are out there for speakers. So you could get a big one that's loud and booming. You could get the smaller one that you just need to hide somewhere so you can put it near your uh, ears so you can hear a little bit better. And then if you have real difficulty, there's amplified solutions out there. One of my favorite speakers that I've used for amplification is out of the marine industry. So it's a nice weather grade marine speaker uh, that is amplified and has its own separate volume control. So definitely look outside of just the I want to mount a speaker in a vehicle world. Look into marine, look into some of the HF options that they provide out there for the HF guys for putting on their rigs um, just because there's more than what's out there. Um, and you can turn this into kind of a DIY, DIY lesson for yourself again, where there's guys out there on eBay and some of these other sites where they sell uh, little amplifiers and you could go out and buy your own speaker, find a place to hide the speaker, maybe fabricate a mount to put the speaker and have a, an external amplifier for that to give it some extra audio boost. Or sometimes you can learn how to make your own eighth inch to speaker adapter and just use any sort of what I would typically call a mid-range speaker for most car audio installations, and that would be an option. So I've okay. actually had vehicles where the cars come with additional speakers because it's designed for like some high-end pre- uh, premium audio system, and I don't need all those speakers. I might replace two of them with better car audio speakers and then use the extra mounting locations, say for a three inch mid range to make it a speaker mount for a scanner and run my wires uh, through the boot from the car door into the vehicle. So there's lots of options out there if you start to get creative. And what's nice is there's a lot of flexibility because of the standardization of the audio interfacing. You got more creative than I did. I just put a speaker in the seat and called it a day. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So um, I've definitely had installations where we've just kind of just put one up in the underneath the kick panel kind of near the driver's foot, but out of the way of the pedals. Um, right. The problem, though, becomes you have to consider where your audio is pointing. Audio is definitely a directional thing. So an amplification is going to play into that. So sometimes you can get away with shoving it under a seat. Sometimes you might find that the speaker is not any better. And then 
you can get really creative with places you can put a speaker. I've seen, I don't know if they're still manufactured, but some of the major car audio manufacturers used to make single DIN speakers. So yeah, you put a scanner somewhere and then you've done, you've already converted your radio to single DIN, but you didn't want to put a scanner in that single DIN. You put a pocket, you could replace it with a speaker. My, my last vehicle, I replaced my ashtray with a speaker. Um, I was not a, I'm not a smoker. I didn't have a need for an ashtray. Um, I didn't like the sound of coins jingling in there. So I was able to just remove the ashtray and it happened to be the same width of a speaker. And I was able to um, buy a speaker off of Amazon for a pretty low price and mount it right up under there. It's a good idea too. So, all right. So we have pretty much everything, you know, wired in. So now we have to make the final connection, right? The radio's got to get plugged into everything now. Let's clean this installation up so it looks nice and hidden as best as we can. When it comes to like a, a mobile radio itself, that's pretty easy, right? Because everything's going to be mounted to the back of the unit. Our, our DC, our line out, our antenna, right? That's all going to be on the outside. I mean, I'm sorry, on the back side of the, of the uh, scanner. When it comes to the handheld radios, though, I mean, we're going to have said everything pretty much there a dc line if we're not gonna run for batteries we're gonna have an antenna line a speaker line for you opting for that as well the best way to clean this up was would be like with a plastic loom correct yeah so plastic loom seems to be my favorite what's become more popular for me more recently and hopefully i can use some brand names here um tech flex yeah, is a yeah tech flex is a product that is out there there are some knockoffs of it basically if you hold it it kind of reminds you of an old chinese finger trap it's this interwoven material you kind of have to do a little bit of research on it to understand how you cut it, how you measure it. There's plenty of information out there on it, but it's a cleaner version of the old plastic loom, and it's a lot less noisy, and you can get it in a lot wider ranges of sizes and colors, um, just if you're willing to wait for it to come from an online or a mail order type, um, maybe a little heat shrink. Zip ties can be useful. Um, one of the yeah, great as long as you cut them. <laughs> yes, so they don't cut you later. <laughs> yes. But with the zip ties, you can get some of the zip tie mounts, even at your local hardware store that use the double-sided adhesive that uses, yep. that's a great way to secure. Oh, some I, of that I love those. Yep. yep. I'm trying to think of anything else. I, 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 that TechFlex product with some heat shrink can really go a long way. So um, in terms of cleaning up wiring, this is another place where I'd steal from probably the car audio industry and uh, definitely look on YouTube and some of your internet search engines and other video sites too see how those guys are kind of cleaning up and identifying wiring. And that's a good place to rob some ideas from. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to go off on a real quick tangent here with you. And uh, I was actually going to wrap this up, but I'm not. So we're talking about wiring in basically one radio, right? We talked about two two radios. Uh, one of the things that I've done in the past, and uh, which could be a good practice if you have a lot of stuff to do, and especially if you are doing a lot of stuff, is you'd want to bring in a, a, a dedicated fuse panel just for the radios, whether it be just a bank of scanner radios. I see a lot of these guys who are uh, stringers that they have probably like six to eight scanners in a center console, or you know, I'm sure you know Harrison with with what you do with the commercial installs, you may have a bunch of two-way radios that that are getting wired in, and uh, the ability to go out there and buy equipment that's readily available to do this stuff is is very easy. Uh, and the installation isn't too much different than what we talked about here, right? You'd want to run some some good heavy gauge wire from the battery, right? Positive. You want to fuse that, bring it in to the uh, the new circuit panel, the, the, the um, fuse panel. From there, you would tap off to all your radios, which is basically what you've talked about already is is making sure that whatever leg you bring off of is is got the right fuse in it. So it's not really anything different than we talked about here, but one of the things that you could try and do is, is is wire in a relay so that when you turn off the car, it then turns off the power to that circuit uh, bus, so you're not draining battery, you know, draining your battery. Um, but there's something else out there too that I've that I've purchased from uh, West Mountain Radio, which actually measures the voltage off the battery. And when the battery voltage gets to a certain point, it actually shuts off that that circuit. But what you can do on the other side of that device is you can plug it into a secondary battery source. And what ends up happening is then you start draining your auxiliary battery to run all your radios. When you turn the car back on again, it will then recharge your auxiliary battery and it'll be ready to go for the next time you go to uh, turn off the, the car and use it. So it, it kind of eliminates that whole need to have relays in there and and kill your battery because the last thing you want to do is is run, you know, say, I, I know guys, a lot of guys are in the fire department and they just 
turn off the car and run inside the firehouse, leave all the radios on or they leave their you know the lights on or something like that. And then if your battery isn't that strong anymore and it's a winter day, you may come back out and find out there's not enough amps left in the battery to, to give yourself a crank. So, yep. um, so you know, one of the things we used to use a lot for that is um, there's a product out there called the Charge Guard, which I believe is now owned by Havis, but there's a lot of products that do the same thing. And what was great about that product was you did not need to have a dedicated ignition sense. And when we say ignition sense, basically we're pulling a 12 volt signal that is super, super low amps just for the purpose of being able to flick a relay or flick something else to say, hey, the vehicle is now on, it's running. The nice thing about the Charge Guard was it had ways to sense that there was power available or not. So one of the great communities we can rob from for this is, again, the car audio community. Pack Audio, Pack PAC, so uh, Papa Alpha Charlie dash audio.com is one of my favorite companies for products like these. They have a couple devices based on how you want to run it to be able to create an ignition sense. And one of the things that they've overcome is for your start stop vehicles, uh, you need a good way to maintain the ignition. So when the engine shuts off while you're sitting at a traffic light, it maintains the ignition. So from the car audio community, we can get a good place to develop an ignition sense that might be something you're not really, you've not really thought of in the past. So one of the examples they have is pulling from an OBD sensor. So basically onboard vehicle diagnostics will tell the vehicle, will tell if it's running or not, and they'll be able to turn it into a 12 volt source. There's also ways to measure the voltage based on whether or not the alternator is running to be able to detect it. So if you look at a product like a charge drive, they'll explain the different modes of how it can detect whether or not there's vehicle ignition and what would trigger that timer that they offer, which can do an immediate shutoff or which can offer you an extended delay so that you could have maybe 30 minutes of the radios or whatever equipment you're running run past the vehicle ignition. Another place we rob from a lot of times is the Marine community. The Marine community has had those same sort of problems where they have to have, consider their source of power. Maybe they have multiple sources of power, such as an onboard battery and a solar panel. So if you look at companies like Blue Sea Systems is one of my favorite companies to get a lot of parts from. They offer a lot of solutions for getting power from multiple sources, being able to determine if you have parasitic drain or shut power off. Um, there's companies out there that make fuse panels that already have the relay built into the fuse panel itself. So it'll have an array of constant power sources and then a, a set of ignition only power sources so that you could provide some devices with ignition only power you could provide some devices with constant on power you could provide some devices with both and i usually avoided the all-in-one devices just because not saying that like west mountain radio makes a bad product or anything there's plenty of products out there that probably do the same sort of thing but the dif difficulty would become if one component on that whole device breaks now that entire device is out of service so usually to create the solution you brought up, we would use a device called a battery isolator. And there's so many different ways to do battery isolations from you know simple oversized diodes that only allow the power to flow in run direction. So you can charge a battery, but not necessarily drain from it unless you hit a button. So now you have a way to pull from power if you need it. But there's also things that are used in the off-road community and the overlanding community. For those unaware with overlanding, it's a activity where guys typically in SUVs or pickup trucks um, go off-roading long distances and usually have to camp. So they want to make sure they have an emergency power supply in case their primary battery goes dead, they can start their vehicle and get back home. So one of the sources they can, or one of the devices they typically use is specific battery isolators. And some of these can get pretty complicated with their modes. Um, I'm thinking of a product off the top of my head from a company called Warren uh, Whiskey Alpha Romeo November that has a multi-mode position. So you can run off of both batteries at the same time. You can run off of one battery and only charge the second one until you need it, or you can simply run off of uh, that one battery um, for if you need to jump, and it has a selector switch to let you decide which mode you need to run in. So this can get pretty complicated pretty quick. Yep, that's that's why I was saying we go there really quick. So, but uh, excellent. So I think we've pretty much covered everything when it comes to an install or a basic install on a, uh, a radio. I mean, is there anything else that we think we would need to touch on uh, with an installation of a, of a radio. So with some of this other stuff, if you are lucky enough to have a vehicle that offers kind of a center mount console or is a, a vehicle typically used by police or fire EMS or other first responders, 
definitely make sure you look be make sure you know the specs of the device you're trying to mount just because you go to a website and you might see that for example i can't find a mount for an sds 200 that doesn't mean they don't have anything that would work the sds 200 dimensions are actually quite close to the old bc 780 xlt and the manufacturer might provide a mount for that so make sure you definitely try to think outside the box um, even with all these pre-manufactured solutions um just because you might get discouraged because a mount is not offered for your device. If you know the dimensions and maybe you know there's another device out there that's about the same dimensions, then you have an option that's pretty close, um, especially if we take from the ham radio community. You know, we have a mount that's designed for a remote head mount of a ham radio. Maybe we could use that on a TRX2 or some other Whistler model that has the detachable faceplate. So definitely start to think about devices that kind of look like and are shaped like the device you're using because you might find although that there's not something offered specifically for that device there's something pretty close and if you're maybe willing to do a little drilling maybe a little sanding maybe a little gluing you could come up with a solution yep exactly so but again if, if you're lucky enough to have a, a vehicle that can drop in a have console or something like that then uh couple of face plates you're all done yeah <laughs> so. but there's definitely some manufacturers and i'll throw this out there too that are <laughs> definitely catering to the covert community so to speak so okay. definitely think about your vehicles that are sold in large fleets mostly your american manufacturers and you'll find out there that there are companies making products beyond that uh the one that immediately comes to my head is there's a company called rockland that makes a drop-in mount for chevys and gmc trucks and suvs so even that giant suburban you have with the giant sweeping center console they have a solution which requires a little bit of modification but they have a solution out there for using your typical have this type faceplate to mount a couple radios in the center console you might lose your cup holders but if that's the trade-off you're willing for to have to be able to mount this stuff that's trade-off yeah i think in this country though everybody wants their cup holders (laughs) (laughs) i know i do so yep yep i hear you all right um anything else you want to bring up about uh vehicle mounting yeah so just make sure you know obviously maintain safety and there's tons of resources on the internet and you can definitely go down some rabbit holes we always got inspired by other ideas we saw and got kind of creative by some of the solutions out there and make sure you look outside of even the ham radio and scanner hobby communities and public safety industries and start looking towards some of your other communities. So if you have an SUV or truck overlanding type communities, we'll obviously have to mount a lot of stuff so you can pull some inspiration from them. Look at some of the options out there for government vehicles. So a lot of fleets now are running into uh, using hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles because they want to maintain a good public image and they want to make sure that they show that they're being efficient with money and being fuel efficient. So they're buying these fuel efficient type vehicles and companies are offering mounting solutions to be able to put onboard printers, computers, things like that. You know, just don't get stuck in the idea that because you don't see an idea out there for mounting something from the ham radio community doesn't mean it's impossible. So right. it takes a little bit of creativity, takes a little bit of learning, takes a little bit of research. But sites out there like Radio Reference have boards dedicated just to oh, yeah. people who do installation. So make sure you get inspiration from other places if you're trying to think of something where you want a creative mount um and you want something beyond just dropping your radio in a cup holder yep exactly well harrison i want to thank you so much for all the ideas and uh the quick schooling on how to safely uh install and mount and and route uh everything required to mount a uh, a radio inside a vehicle i want to thank you for your time thank you for coming back for a second time here on scanner school and uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here and, and hope to have you back again real soon. Yep, I enjoyed it. And hopefully we don't run into uh, people performing illegal activities while doing mobile installations too. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much. Harrison, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. I greatly appreciate it. And I hope that everybody out there understands that you know vehicle installs isn't so difficult to do. It's just kind of knowing the right places to tap into the electrical, the right places to mount your scanners. And I'm sure there's some stuff out there that we probably didn't talk about, but we want to make sure that we can give the information without overloading you. And again, if you just don't feel right doing it, if you don't feel comfortable, definitely find a radio shop that'll do this. There's plenty of places out there. You can go to your local fire department, find out where they have their vehicles installs done or uh, get into your local two-way group. Or if you just go to like a car stereo installation place, they can probably get this taken care of for you as well if you're just not comfortable with it. But in the end, 
some great information in this podcast. And uh, again, I want to thank Harrison so much for joining us on the podcast. Now, again, I also would like to thank our Patreon supporters. Now, the Patreon supporters, I have a couple different tiers out here. There's a dollar tier, a three dollar tier, and a five dollar tier. And if you jump in at the five dollar tier, that will get you the podcast. Not only get you the podcast early, but you'll get a really cool squelchy sticker pack, which is basically as our, our logo, a mod, our our a little cartoon character. And uh, I got some bumper stickers that are just with his, you know, his character. And you can stick one on the back of your of your vehicle. You could give it to your kids to put somewhere or whatever. But uh, they're really cool. And again, you get that at the $5 level. Now, again, the $5 level too, if you think about it, once Patreon takes their cut, I'm getting about a little bit more than a dollar a session if you donate at the $5 level. So really, if you think about it, this podcast for everybody who's donating five bucks, I'm getting maybe at a buck and a quarter. So, you know, that's that's how the pledging, you know, that's how the pledging goes. So again, it's not a lot. I'm not making a lot of it. It's enough to kind of offset some of the costs, which is really great. Cause to be honest with you, right now, I'm leaving tomorrow for a cruise. I'm sending this podcast to my editor. While I'm away, they're going to work on it. So when I come back, the podcast is ready to go and to be published. I'm able to now enjoy my vacation without having to worry about rushing this podcast out when I come back from vacation. So again, it's you guys, the Patreon supporters, those of you who use my affiliate links that allow me to be able to not only bring you the podcast, but also to not make money on it, but to help offset the cost. So with that said, I want to thank the following Patreon supporters. We have Dan, Glenn Bryden, James Felling, MT Bono, Raymond Hill, Dan, Todd Glendie, and at the $5 level, Craig Harper, Guy Lee, Irvin Thibodeau, Jeff Block, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth R. Fowler, Ronnie Bach, Sal Marandola, Scott Vorder, Signals Everywhere, and William R. Can. I want to thank each and every one of you for your continued month over month support. Now, again, if you'd like to help support Scanner School but don't want to become a Patreon member, which again means monthly donations, you can do so with a one time uh, PayPal donation. If you are big into buying on Amazon, which I'm sure a lot of us are going to be big into Amazon now that it's starting to become the holiday season, you go to scannerschool.com slash support. We have links there for Amazon, Butel Software, and Scanner Master. So you have other ways to help support us out and they don't cost you anything to do that. It's a great way to help us and uh, can do it for at no additional cost to you, which is awesome. All right, guys, I want to thank you all again. This Again, this is session number 99. Next week is session 100. I have a huge surprise for you guys, something I hope you guys will enjoy and like. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm still building it out right now as I'm recording this, so I'm really hoping that it is done and on time for session number 100. I have a, a nice little shift I'd like to take the podcast in and uh, something for all of you to kind of uh, bring the community together because without you guys, this wouldn't be here. So I want to put something out there to kind of thank all of you as well. So with that, Scanner Schools, copyright 2019, Monitor Long Island. My name is Phil Lichtenberger. My material call sign is W2LIE. And this is Scanner School, where we teach you everything you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. 73 of one.